course of your research, what did you learn about how well the three protagonists got along with each other personally? Did they enjoy each other's company and, and seek each other out? Yes. Well, um, the, the Mrs. Thatcher and the Pope saw each other uh, very infrequently. I think they probably saw each other no more than three times. Uh, they didn't know each other well, and their feelings toward each other were those of respect rather than warmth or affection. Um, Mrs. That's certainly true for the folks here. Mrs. Thatcher, a friend of his, told me that he greatly respected her, but he didn't really get on, you know, he didn't feel comfortable in, in her company. And I'm not surprised, because she wouldn't have felt comfortable in his. She would have been a bit overawed at one level and not quite known, she, uh, not quite known how, to, how to cope. Um, now, the, uh, but, but she did respect him, and of course the British, she, and the, she was particularly grateful for the strong stand he took in Ireland against terrorism when he visited Armour in 1980. Um, now, Reagan and the Pope, again, met each other only, I think, about seven times. Um, that's what Lee Edwards thinks, and I think he's about right. And it was always for periods of an hour or so. But they established a much warmer relationship. They liked each other, and at the very first meeting, uh, the Pope emerged. By the way, no one else was present at these meetings. Uh, the Pope emerged and said to um, Cardinal Silvestrini and Cardinal Casseroli, Reagan is a good man. He's a disarmer. He wants to rid the world of nuclear weapons. Now, that's quite significant because in 1982 when this happened, no one knew that about Reagan. I mean, with, a year later we get the Star Wars speech, which is the first indication to the mass public of this man is not quite what we thought he was earlier. But the Pope was one of the first people to be told this, to see this, and he responded warmly. Uh, I don't know how many of you are Catholics here, but as you, those who are probably know that, that, um, that Catholic doctrine on questions of you know, war, peace, and, and other political matters is it's the Church's duty to lay down the moral principles which should guide leaders, but it is the, up to the responsible authorities to implement these things in a practical way. So once the Pope had satisfied himself, that Reagan was actuated by the right moral principles. He was then really prepared to let him get on with things. And, and from that point on, he really restrained a lot of criticism of Reagan in the Catholic Church, and particularly from the US Catholic bishops, who didn't like him at all. <laughs> and um, so, so they, that was a warm relationship, and I think very warm. And you certainly get that impression when you read the very moving telegram that the Pope sent to Nancy Reagan on the death of the uh, president. And, I mean, he says, um, um, he refers to Reagan as a noble soul. Quite a thing, you know, I mean, for the Pope to say. And, and it's a very moving, uh, moving uh, telegram. Now, of course, the warmest relationship with Mrs. Thatcher and Reagan. Um, they met each other in 75. They established two things. They liked each other and they were on the same wavelength. They, Reagan thereafter kept her, kept sending, arranged that she would always receive his speeches and telegrams. Um, when when um, he was elected, she was the first visitor, first serious visitor to the White House. Um, he, gave a, he gave a state dinner for her. The following night, when she gave a state dinner, um, he broke precedent by attending the dinner because uh, normally it's the vice president who, goes, who, who accepts the return invitation. And they saw each other a very great deal. They had rounds. There were differences. They didn't, um, and the rounds were. Um, and the rounds were never, 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 never bitter. And, and she had a way of dealing with him. It's really quite funny. He'd be sitting opposite her at some meeting, and she would have some disagreement. So she would say, um, uh, Richard, I really don't see how you can possibly argue this point, I mean, etc., etc. Or, George, and really, you're completely wrong here. You see, she would never attack Reagan. <laughs> she would, would always be, she'd argue with the guys on Reagan's right and left. And, and, and the fact, which of course Reagan knew what she was doing, but, and, and, but he, he liked, he, he liked her. And he, and he liked her Bodicea act. Uh, he sometimes found it amusing, and even when it was against him, you know, he, he, he rolled with the punches. Um, and that, and, you know, he was a generous, he was a generous man, but they liked each other. They effectively made a pact that they would never criticize each other in public or would give each other solid political support. That broke down on only two occasions, really. Uh, one of them was, the most important one was Grenada. And, and there, I, th I think we have to say that Reagan was right on the issue, but she was justified in feeling that she'd been publicly humiliated by being so obviously left out of, kept out of the loop, which weakened her in British politics for a while. But, you know, 
Uh, that happened on a Tuesday, so to speak. A Thursday, he rings her up and says, Margaret, um, uh, I feel I should throw my hat in the door before coming in. <laughs> and, uh, and she said, oh, there's no need to talk like that, Ron. And by the end of the conversation, they're back on very close terms. And he says, uh, she says, I've got to go now because I've got to go to the House of Commons. And he says, eat them up. Eat them alive. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and that was the way it was. And they, so as I say, it was a very close and a very warm relationship. Uh, and, and when you look at the three of them, you have to say Reagan is the pivotal figure. Because he was close to the Pope and he was close to Thatcher. Whereas, of course, the two other figures admired each other, but were not particularly close. Yes, there's a lady here, I think, had a question. I was going to ask you about the uh, British Conservative Party. We really have heard practically nothing from them all these years that would make them even remotely resemble uh, the great uh, yes. Thatcher's party. Is there any um, movement to uh, see? Well, I think if you've heard nothing from them, you're lucky, really, because... <laughs> Because by and large, they, they, they haven't said a great deal that's worth listening to. Um, I think that they, they suffered a nervous breakdown when they, when they got rid of Mrs. Thatcher, from which they've never really recovered. Uh, and they don't quite know what they stand for. They can't integrate her into the history of the party effectively as they could do with Churchill, because Churchill left in a glow of, of good fellowship. And um, they are, in a sense, floundering around. They've also been, been, been bemused by the brilliant performing act of um, Tony Blair, yeah. who, by moving into the, some of their territory, has left them with, you know, not quite certain how to do things. I, I, um, I you know, I, this is a topic which I should either speak for three hours or two or, or a minute, because I, but I think I'll just do a minute on this occasion. And, uh, but, uh, but if you're interested in it, there's a very, very good website called www.conservativehome.com. Conservative Home, all one word. It's run by a man called Tim Montgomery. Tim is a former aide to Ian Duncan Smith, who was party leader for a while. He is a conservative who has, uh, in a sense, a social conservative and an economic one. Um, he was given the job. Uh, he, he's, what he's trying to do is to create in England the conservative movement, which is such an assistance to the Republican Party in this country. A part, uh, and uh, it was put very well to me by. Um, uh, and, and he came over here to study the movement. He's gone back and he's trying to encourage the development of different groups in different areas, special issue groups, that to, to, to form, a, 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 in a sense, to work on conservative culture, creating a strong conservative political culture in England from which the Conservative Party could benefit. And I think that's very sensible. And I think it's sensible because a similar thing in Australia has happened. Um, uh, I was talking to a senior figure in the... Um, in the Liberal Party in Australia, which is the Conservative Party. And he said to me, the, the success of John Howard in winning four elections, and he may not win the next one, but you know, eventually everybody loses, but um, uh, he's won four elections. He said the success is due to the fact that Howard is both the leader of the Conservative Party and the leader of the Conservative movement. And uh, he's therefore able to call on the loyalty of a whole series of groups which are not technically part of the party, but which will go out and work for him and, and give, give support during the, uh, not when, you know, between elections. And I think that the Conservative Party in Britain suffers from the fact that it hasn't got this movement in the country. It used to have it, it atrophied, it has to be recreated. I think Tim is a person to watch because he is trying to recreate it. And whether he succeeds or fails, He's document, you, you can follow the progress of this on this site, which is a very well, and it's a very interesting site, and I mean, I, 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 I follow it a lot. Well, thank you so much. I think that's the <laughs>